I first off want to start by uh, thanking Common Council for rescheduling us. I know we were, I think, originally scheduled to do this back in October. So I appreciate you rescheduling it for now. Uh, the reason we, as you uh, know, the reason why we needed to reschedule it is because I had a meeting with our nearby neighbors in um, uh, Stonehenge and Hawthorne, and it was pretty clear to me that we needed to spend more time uh, listening to those folks, uh, talking about certain elements of the proposal. So what we did is we engaged um, Mary Claire Lancer to essentially go door to door and um, she provided uh, sort of our listening, she was our listening channel. She also put together a nice little report that, we'll, that I'll talk about here in a bit. But um, that was really important for us to kind of think about what we want to do, when we want to do it, what changes we're, we're, we're uh, contemplating. Um, so today's presentation is really structured with that in mind. So I've got a really terrific panel of speakers here to talk about a lot of different things, but it's really designed to kind of react to some of the comments that we heard um, through that dirt campaign. So um, in terms of today, we're going to uh, present a concept for you guys called Ballpark Commons, which <coughs> you heard about. And as Joel said, this is a not necessarily a new proposal, uh, but it's vastly improved since its inception two years ago. And what I can say is it's got a lot of, of everything in it. You know, it's love, it's dislike, it's, uh, you know, misunderstood. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I'd say it's still very unknown uh, amongst Franklin residents. And while it's got its opposition, I would also suggest that, you know, it's got the support, at least from the channels that we're, we're uh, poked into, it's got the support <coughs> of the majority of Franklin of residents. Um, it doesn't mean it's perfect, doesn't mean that there's uh, not a lot of work still to be done, but it, it seemingly has a lot of, lot of support behind it as well. So Joel, like you did, in terms of kind of looking back <coughs> at history, I was, I was preparing for um, today's presentation, and I went back and essentially looked at all of the different articles, because as everybody knows, this is a pretty well-documented um, project. So I want to walk everybody through that, because I think it's, it, it adds sort of interesting um, context to where we are today. So as a reminder, back in 2013, uh, I submitted a proposal to, at the time, uh, the then current Mayor Taylor and the then current um, Alderman. And the proposal was essentially a city finance stadium with the hope that development would be right around the corner. And then a month later, uh, that same Common Council rejected, uh, but they gave me a counteroffer. And I completely forgot about this point, but the, the, there's an article out there that talks about this. And the counteroffer was, if you could commit to the development, and at the time it was $40 million, we would be interested in uh, evaluating that. So my reaction at the time was I need to do some self-reflection. I ultimately came back, um, did some self-reflection, and committed to the $40 million worth of development. And did that as evidenced in the MOU that I negotiated uh, with, the, with the city staff at that, at that period of time. So we then negotiated the MOU, in, and then in March 2014, it received uh, unanimous, I believe it was unanimous, um, support from the then task force that ultimately proposed to the Common Council at the time to <coughs> move forward uh, with, with the uh, MOU. And then in April 2014, the Common Council went into closed session and voted down proposal 6 to 0, citing uh, multiple unknowns. And, uh, there's a couple articles out there that talk about what those unknowns are. Specifically, they are no firm commitments from developers, uh, lack of land ownership, and then lack of county support. However, Joel, as Joel said, the county did approve the use of the stadium. So, you know, I share this again as, you know, a means to remind everybody about all the work that's been done. So a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about, we've, uh, you know, we've talked about DNR issues. I'm not saying we shouldn't revisit them, but I think there's a really interesting body of work that can be leveraged as we, as we, you know, reevaluate this. But the other thing in terms of the unknowns, um, I'd say, you know, it was, it was really tough time for me to go through that. When you guys said no, I'd say I'm kind of glad you did it because today's proposal, the concept that we've got today, is pretty strong, um, and I've worked through a lot of those unknowns. So, um, and I'll walk you through what, what those are. I mean, the first is Oak Creek. We spent about a year trying to get to a deal with Oak Creek, and there's a misconception out there that Oak Creek said no to the proposal, and it's simply not true. Oak Creek wanted to do the deal. They said yes. As a matter of fact, they signed a memo of understanding with us, and it was based on us securing a piece of property off of Highway 94 between um, Drexel and Rawson if we could win uh, the land, which was at the time in receivership. 
Um, so long story short, we were unable to, we lost the land to Continental and I sat back and kind of reevaluated everything. But there were things then going on in this city of Franklin that reignited my interest because what people always ask me is, why, why are you making another run at this? And I would say simply because I think the, I've evolved, but I think the city's evolved too, um, as signaled through the three studies that you guys are doing, um, which I think signals to developers that you, you want to be a competitive city. So you've got these three TIF studies going on in, in a number of areas. And as um, Aaron said, this is area A. <clears throat> There's a number of surveys out there that talk about how hungry, um, no pun intended, but how hungry the city of Franklin is for retail and restaurants. And then lastly, the, rec the recruitment of uh, the economic development director. Um, sort of long, long time coming, and Aaron, welcome. Uh, but all those to me, I think, were signs. So again, I share, I share this with you because I think it becomes a foundational element to the narrative, our narrative. When I say our narrative, I'm talking about the developer's narrative, but also the city's narrative in terms of where we're at today. <clears throat> so now what I want to do is I want to just give you a, <coughs> excuse me, give you an executive summary of Ballpark Commons. So I wrote this and I want to kind of go one by one. It took me a bit to write this, but I think it's a pretty good summary of what we're trying to do. So carrying forward the vision of Franklin residents, we are proposing a sports anchored development called Ballpark Commons. By leveraging the success of the Rock and building a stadium and indoor training and tournament center, the collective sports venues will become a catalyst for creating a sustainable, walkable, bikeable, connected mixed use neighborhood and sports destination, which is very attractive to top talent and employers, millennials, and an aging population that can all live, work, and play in a fully integrated community. All told, we estimate 100, somewhere between 100 and 130 million dollars worth of development in phase one of Area A. And we think that this is just the start of, of, of Area A. But perhaps more compelling is the sense of community and civic pride that will be derived by a development like this. These sorts of places, the ones that are rich in social networks, are becoming how cities compete for the future. This is not a Me Too development. We're not trying to be Drexel Town Square, Milwaukee, or Waukesha suburban projects. It is designed to be smaller, more connected, and most importantly, completely unique. It's a spectacular opportunity for Franklin to promote itself as a community capable of accomplishing a wide range of development from subdivisions to forward-thinking mixed-use projects, projects that can be safely labeled smart growth. Ballpark Commons can be seen as a true place-making project, mixing home, work, recreation, and entertainment in the way real communities used to develop before subsidized far-flung suburbs became the norm. For the city of Franklin, this development presents an incredible opportunity to promote, promote itself as the suburb that has the best of both worlds. You can live in a cul-de-sac in a classic subdivision or choose to live in an apartment that is close to restaurants, entertainment, and groceries. There are few opportunities in Franklin for the sorts of chance encounters that lead to friendships and collaborations. Mixed-use developments designed and programmed with networking top of mind is an opportunity to live and work in a setting much more attractive to millennials and empty nesters who want to age in place. It's also important to note that this project is not possible unless we come together in a public-private partnership. <clears throat> Lastly, we plan on being inclusive with our immediate neighbors and Franklin residents as a whole to continue to design and program ballpark comments. <clears throat> so I want to walk you through um, what the results of Mary Claire's study was, but before I do that, I just totally neglected to talk about a couple other elements that weren't in the proposal before. One of the things that you guys cited was uh, no firm commitments. So as soon as we put together the, the one of the last renditions, <coughs> we received four pretty firm commitments from developers that wanted to come into your city and develop. We worked through that selection process. We picked Blair Williams from Wired. He's gonna come up and talk about the mixed use in the apartments, but we picked him as our partner to go forward, assuming you guys wanna go forward. So the, in terms of fir firm commitments, we've got land acquisitions. We didn't have the land in our control before. Today we do. We own the Paradonovich farm. We also picked up uh, the DOT land that is in our plan. UWM, UWM is here to talk as well. They were not part of the plan before. They have a, we have a letter of intent with those guys to come play baseball here. Um, so they're an important anchor, uh, and I'll let the coach talk about why their program needs this type of uh, place to plan. You also cited lack of county involvement. As the mayor said, the county's here. <clears throat> We've had multiple meetings. Uh, just about a month ago, or maybe less, we met with the mayor, the county executive, a lot of county executives. Um, and I would say, and I think it's fair to say that county is very much supportive of what we're doing. Um, 
the devil's always in the detail, um, but they're very supportive, and I would suggest that they're sitting, wait, waiting to get to yes, realizing that we still have to put together a media proposal in front of them. So they're supportive from what I can tell. And then lastly, you know, the thing that we didn't have before is we were sort of an unproven operator. Um, before I, you know, I just purchased the wave. I think actually I purchased the wave after that. Um, but I wanted to sink my teeth into operating support teams. Now I'm happy to report that we've got three, you know, three successful um, sports teams that we run. And you know, the example that that another presenter is going to talk about is Kokomo, Indiana. And you know, that's significant really at three different levels. Number one, uh, because it proves that we can operate successfully, which is I think part of our, the concern is will we be here forever. Well, in terms of Kokomo, we were number one in our league, league in terms of financial performance. We also were in the top quartile in terms of, of uh, being a performer that operates uh, baseball teams. This idea that the stadium could be a catalyst for economic development, Kokomo was a little different. They took a huge leap of faith. They invested $10.5 million with the hope that it would come, and that was a year ago. And uh, two months ago, what they, what they reported uh, as part of their revitalization project was a recent announcement of $32 million of mixed-use development that is quoted as this would have not happened if the stadium wasn't there, meaning the development, the developer said if the stadium wasn't built, we, we wouldn't be doing this. And then lastly, again, Josh is going to talk about it, but this truly, this, this uh, baseball project galvanized this community in a really interesting way, and we're going to talk about that later. So again, <coughs> I, I say that because, you know, it's a much more involved proposal. I think, you know, over the last two years, we're all better for it, for it, but now we come to the table with a pretty sophisticated proposal. So now let's talk about the uh, findings of, I'm going to call this the Mary Claire Report, if you don't mind. Um, so the, the, the work that was done door to door, and this, is, this take, will take about five minutes, but I think it's important um, to, to the dialogue here, um, was done for about 45 days. Um, the subdivisions that we canvassed were Hawthorne, Stonehenge, and Whitnell Terrace. We knocked on 188 doors, uh, and when I say we, I mean Mary Claire. Uh, we spoke to, of the 188, we spoke to 131 people, and those conversations were either, were less than a minute, up to 90 minutes each. We also biz, uh, visited with businesses along, along the uh, Rawson and 76 corridor, uh, specifically 48 businesses, mostly managers and business owners. And we also contacted numerous residents and business owners that were recommended by other contacts. So the summary of that feedback was that adjacent homeowners were, were our top priority and now we started with the closest pro properties to, on Hawthorne and Stonehenge. And nearly everyone appreciated the personal outreach. The closer people live to proposed development, the more likely they are to be opposed. If people are neutral or supportive, they don't want their neighbors to know. Nearly all businesses closest to Rawson and 76th Street strongly support the, the sports complex expansion because of increased vitality it would bring to this trade area. Some mentioned that more rooftops would increase their customer base. <coughs> in terms of Hawthorne, no homes predate landfill operations and the closest homes that were built in the 1970s. And their top concern was methane management. There are two reported methane incidents that occurred in the 1990s. We told re and we told residents that the DNR has ultimate approval authority and that if the DNR denies this application, the sports complex cannot be expanded. Their second concern was water quality. All homes have private wells of varying depths. Closest homes have their water tested for chemicals twice per year. No one we met with reported positive findings for identified chemicals. But there is concern, however, that ground disturbance will decrease water quality and quantity. Their third concern was property values. Um, in terms of the other side, or South Rawson, there is not much opposition to the proposed development south of Rawson as to the sports complex expansion proposed north of Rawson. When asked for suggestions for additional development at the Rock, the primary response was none, ever. Stonehenge. Homeowners built with the understanding that the proposed multifamily mixed-use site would be developed as R3, executive single-family lots, like their own. Their top concern was decreased property values. Residents believe that apartments will decrease their values, especially for those homes adjacent to the site proposed for rezoning. Their second concern was safety given perceived caliber of renters at any rental price point or demographic. There were many themes, but mostly many will be interested in a lot of the detail you know, about architecture, materials, landscaping, renderings. Some mentioned decreasing our density. There was not as much opposition, however. In fact, some outright support the proposed expansion to the sports complex. 
Most liked the horse farm, some of you adjacent did not. Thematically for both neighborhoods, there is concern around lights and noise. Residents are skeptical that current levels indeed meet city ordinances. There also is concern of traffic. I believe Rawson is already in poor repair and there are questions about how increased traffic will affect those residents. Roadway design capacity, roadway jurisdiction, approval of access points, and traffic impact analysis were all described as topics of required subsequent approvals. They also were concerned and had doubts about viability of the minor league baseball. A major theme was that many neighbors used and liked the rock and appreciate that Mike is pro Franklin resident and business owner. There's concern about the requested financial participation. <coughs> there is an over, a theme of sympathy with residents who live closer, including Greendale residents who are affected by lights and noise. There's another theme of Franklin that should establish and promote their vision for development instead of missing opportunities. Another concern is the distrust of regulating agencies, politicians, and the applicant. Uh, let's see, there is um, much misunderstanding about TIF, even about what a pilot is. There are questions about who will own county owned land. Several asked that if the rock expansion could occur without financial participation by the city, others asked if expansion at the rock could occur without the development. In terms of businesses, vacant storefronts, properties are in need of repair, and struggling businesses may take. Some of the shopping centers appear less than vibrant. Nearby residents identify retail and dining destinations in other communities such as Oak Creek and Brookfield instead of patronizing local businesses. There is unanimous support, except for four, I guess it's not unanimous, two opposed. One, it's also important, one of, this, one of the, these business owners also lives in Stonehenge, but would not tell us why they're opposed. One skeptic and is still studying and one opposed to just the apartment component. Support for a special information meeting about our plans for business owners who are making decisions about their leases was fully supported. And then nearly all businesses owners expressed frustration with customer and sales numbers and strongly endorse the plan. So that's the report out on the neighbors and we think that that's relevant both in terms of how we customized our presentation but also as, as you guys think about um,